State of the Japanese State, which is the latest output of Professor Gavin McCormack here on my right. Um, and he is Emeritus Professor at the School of Culture, History and Language at the College of Asia and Pacific, Australian National University. And Australian National University is something he has in common with uh, Professor Arthur Stockwin, uh, who got his PhD there. And I believe they go back quite a long way um, in terms of working together on various things. Anyway, um, Professor Gavin McCormack has published uh, quite a number of books. Uh, his research focuses on issues to do with the Japanese state and also to do with Okinawa uh, in particular. And it was before my time, but I gather that his book, Client State, Japan in the American Embrace was also launched here about 10 years ago. Um, and uh, Professor Stockwin, I'm sure, is known to uh, perhaps most of you in this room. Um, but he's been uh, in the United Kingdom for most of his career uh, and was the. Australia uh, too. And Australia as well. Okay, since 1982 you've been yeah. here, which is, well, he seems like a long time to me. Um, and uh, he. was <laughs> always long in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> and he was uh, director of the Nissan Institute at Oxford University and remains very active um, in writing about things to do with Japanese politics in particular. So I think that Gavin is going to go first, and I'll hand over to you. Okay, shall I just begin then? Sure. Uh, would you like to stand up here? Or you just yeah. Just a microphone. There is a microphone there as well, so it's up top. Um, I'm like more comfortable sitting, but does that mean that people can't hear me if, I, if I'm sitting? No, fine, we're okay. Fine. Is it okay? All yeah. right. Uh, well, Thank you very much for the, the possibility to be here and to speak to you this evening on the launch of this new book. Uh, I, uh, apart from my, uh, my various um, university connections in Australia, now Australian National University, uh, I did teach at Leeds University in the 1970s. And it was a great pleasure for me to return to Leeds University to uh, launch another book just last week. Uh, in fact, it was my first return to Leeds University in 41 years. And I said, as I spoke at that occasion, that um, 41 years is a long time, but I'd like to think they might invite me back in another 41 years' time. <laughs> also, apart from my academic association with, um, with Australian National University, I also represent uh, the Asia-Pacific Journal of Japan Focus. And, uh, uh, since I've been retired from ANU for quite a long time, actually much of my time is now taken with, uh, with working on the, the Asia Pacific Journal of Japan Focus. And much of what I write uh, is, in one form or another, uh, is published uh, at um, what we still call Japan Focus. Um, so over the past several decades, I've written a good deal about the Japanese state, uh, and especially about the, the 20, early 21st century state of Abe Shinzo. Abe now has a, a super two-thirds majority in the Diet and contemplates political dominance, possibly extending through the inauguration of a new imperial regime uh, in <coughs> April 2019, the Tokyo Olympic Games 2020, and possibly a revised constitution before retiring sometime in 2021. But this scenario is far from certain. The Japanese state is deeply conflicted. Although Prime Minister Abe declares repeatedly that Japan is a country of universal values, democratic, recognizing basic human rights and the rule of law, virtually all members of his government belong to an organization, Nihon Kaigi, whose rightist reactionary blend of neoconservatism, neo-nationalism, and historical revisionism would, in any other contemporary democratic state, likely be seen as extremist or ultra-nationalist. Underpinning all state policies is the principle of faithful service to a country that is chronically war-prone and recognizes submission to no law. Nominally uh, pacifist, constitutionally pacifist, um, and dedicated by Abe to the cause of positive pacifism, uh, Abe's Japan offers unconditional support uh, to the crass, capricious, violent, and xenophobic United States of Donald Trump. Uh, 
So it's more than 10 years since in 2007 uh, I coined the term client state to refer to post-war Japan, and I still find the concept useful. It's a term, I stress, that it's a term that I borrowed not from any radical critic, but from the arch-conservative and former Deputy Prime Minister, Gotoda Masaharu. Um, it's, others have written about it in, uh, in, uh, in recent years. Uh, in 2012, the, the former senior diplomat, Magosaki, Magosaki Ukeru, wrote a comprehensive study of Japan's post-war history in which he, he didn't use the word zokkoku or client state, but in effect the identical concept, identifying confront, confronting factions within the state, on the one hand favoring servility, uh, that Siju Senro, Rosen, Rosen, Siju Rosen, uh, and autonomy, Jishu Rosen. The servilists insist on the alliance with the United States as the charter of the state, with de facto priority over the Constitution, on the absolute privilege of United States military presence in Japan, particularly Okinawa, and on either constitutional revision or revision of the interpretation of the, uh, so as to allow collective security and normal military power. Autonomists, on the other hand, attempt to formulate an independent foreign policy um, tied to the United Nations and to disarmament, reducing or eliminating U.S. military bases and interpreting the Constitution's Article 9 strictly. They call for equidistant diplomacy with China uh, and the U.S. and favor positive engagement in the construction of an Asian or East Asian community. Uh, in Magasaki's view, the servile line gradually became entrenched uh, through the post-1945 decades. It was followed by government after government, uh, and the servile line governments lasted longer <coughs> and had a greater impact than uh, autonomous line ones. I returned to the question of client statism after the book in 2007. I returned uh, to discussing it in its comparative dimension in 2013. Uh, and then again in discussions with John Dower in a book published only in Japanese in 2014, uh, and now most recently in the book which is on the table before us today. I stress that the, that the notion that Japan is a client state is no longer a rare or extreme position. Uh, a number of books uh, citing this frame of reference, most recently perhaps Shirai Satoshi and Uchida Tatsuru, who titled their book, Zokoku Minshishigi, Client State Democracy. The system has evolved over the post-1945 years in several phases to today's Abe politics. The institutional frame of the state set more than 60 years ago is increasingly at odds with the geopolitical and economic realities of today. So Japan is unique in today's world in that its state structure was essentially designed and built to the interests of a foreign occupying force. The foundations laid seven decades ago, the Constitution uh, and the San Francisco Treaty, uh, remain more or less unaltered. The Japanese Emperor Hirohito, till war's end commander-in-chief of the Imperial Japanese <coughs> Army, was retained as emperor and became a favored instrument of US purpose. It was at his suggestion that Okinawa was severed from Japan under the San Francisco Treaty, and at his suggestion that the country's security was made to depend on, I quote, initiatives taken by the United States representing the Anglo-Saxons. It's not hard to imagine how the, the, the Tenno, the emperor, not doubting that his people were his loyal, the people were his loyal subjects, feared and hated communism with its pro proletarian internationalism uh, and calls for overthrow of the emperor system goes without saying that the, the Tenno was a key proponent of the formula defined by John Foster Dulles as a crux of the San Francisco Treaty. Uh, in Dulles's words, do we get the right to station as many troops in Japan as we want, where we want, and for as long as we want? That is the principal question. So ironically, Hirohito Showa Emperor moved from being high-ranked war criminal suspect to being a major architect even a progenitor of the Japanese state of today. The, uh, the US-Japan relationship uh, set by the San Francisco Treaty in 1951 was confirmed by a diet vote in 1960, but it was only first described as an alliance in 1980. 
In 1982, Nakasone Yasuhiro offered the unforgettable account of the relationship in which Japan would serve as the United States' unsinkable aircraft carrier. Though from 1960 never submitted to parliamentary debate, the alliance has been repeatedly renewed and reinforced. With the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union nearly 30 years ago, politicians, both conservative and progressive, and much of Japanese civil society as well, came to think it inappropriate for Japan, now a great economic power, to remain locked in servility to its erstwhile conqueror and occupier. That it was time, in other words, to move from subservience to autonomy. But how would they articulate such a posture? Broadly speaking, the most influential responses were on the right from Abe Shinzo and his colleagues in organs such as Nihon Kaigi, uh, and on the left, you know, only in quotes, but on the left, uh, relatively speaking, from Hosokawa Morihiro, Prime Minister in 1993 4, uh, and Hatoyama Yukio, uh, Prime Minister 2009 10. Abe Shinzo, first seated in the Diet in 1993, helped mould a post Cold War design for an order that would fuse neo nationalism, historical revisionism, and neo Shinto uh, state polity, Kokutai. It implied fundamental revision of the institutions installed by the United States in the post war and occupation era settlement. He was inclined to want to change the democratic post war state's liberal democratic model to a nationalism that reflected the Shinto national polity. Calling for an end to the post war regime, he stood for a fundamental revision of the US imposed post-war system. He became actively involved in a number of movements, the Liberal, history, the liberal View of History <coughs> movement, launched in 1995, the Committee to Produce New History Textbooks, 1997, uh, the Diet Members Association for the Passing On of Correct History, um, 1995, Nihon Kaigi, established 1997, uh, and the Shinto Politics League, established earlier but very much more prominent from the late 1990s. Abe and his associates must have worried over whether to openly confront the contradiction between their nationalist line and civility to the United States. We don't know whether they were conscious of the, the contradiction, uh, but their neo-nationalism drew upon the notion of worship of the Shinto national polity that reached its peak between the late 19th century and wartime. They imagined that beneath the emperor, Japan was a unique, superior, beautiful country, uh, as uh, Abe himself put it, or as then <coughs> Prime Minister Mori put it in 2000, the <coughs> land of the gods centered on the emperor. This I now think of uh, as may be referred to as the clientelist line Mark I, and I'll speak in a moment about what I think of as Mark II. What Abe and his colleagues struggled to articulate was a Japanese nationalist line that would simultaneously negate and affirm, or in any way be consonant with clientelism. So that's, on the right, this kind of, uh, this kind of a, attempt to articulate a post-Cold War um, uh, identity for Japan coming from people like Mr. Abe. On the left, and I use that only in quotes, it's a liberal challenge really. Uh, on the progressive side, clientelism was criticized, uh, it was subject to critical assault, uh, first by the Hosokawa government in 1993-4, and then by the Democratic Party of Japan, especially in the Hatoyama government of 2019. Uh, Hosokawa commissioned Higuchi Kotaro of Asahi Bia to report and advise on security and defense policy. And Higuchi, in due course, taking into account even then signs of the slow decay, of the slow decline of US hegemonic power, recommended Japan adopt a more autonomous, multilateral, UN centered diplomacy. But by the time his report was tabled, uh, Prime Minister Hosokawa had already resigned, and the, debate, the report was never debated. Never debated, but from Washington it drew a categoric, categorical response, utterly rejecting in advance any such proposal. 
the, in the 1995 report, commonly known after its principal author, Joseph Nye, as the Nye Report, the, the principle of East Asian security depending on the oxygen of US military presence was articulated, so the US bases had to be retained, and the US should continue to exercise the right to, uh, to dictate policy. This group uh, uh, of uh, Japan handlers, as they're very commonly called, um, issued then a series of reports on what was expected of Japan in this, in this world order in 2000, 2007, and 2012. Under the oversight of Nye and his colleagues, the legal and institutional reforms to reinforce the alliance and to consolidate civility were adopted, as well as the highly specific demands to show the flag in the Middle Eastern conflict, have boots on the ground in Iraq, and dispatch the maritime self-defense force to the Indian Ocean, step up military spending, uh, and so on and so on. All uh, utterly at odds with the recommendations of the Higuchi report. So the NAI, um, really it's the, it's the CSIS, the, uh, um, the, 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 the institute to which NAI and others belonged, its thinking, I think, was predicated on two general principles. Um, one, a distrust of Japan and a belief in the need for US military occupation to continue indefinitely. That may have been uh, rooted in American establishment thinking Perhaps it reflected not just the bitter memories of the war, but also the paternalism of General MacArthur, to whom the Japanese, um, MacArthur in 1951, describing them as a juvenile and immature people aged just 12 years old compared to the 45-year-old Anglo-Saxons and Germans. It's the sort of view later expressed by Henry Kissinger, who happens to be a senior advisor and counselor to the CSIS, um, speaking to Joe and Lai in 1971, of the Japanese people as erratic and dangerous, needing to be restrained. It was the military dominance of the United States that keeps Japan from pursuing aggressive policies. It is also it's the concept later uh, referred to as the cap in the bottle uh, by Marine Corps Major General Henry Stackpole. It's as if the United States forces occupy bases in Japan in order to protect Asia from Japan. So that first challenge from the left, if you like, the, the, uh, the, the Hosokawa, uh, the Higuchi report of the Hosokawa, um, led nowhere. Fourteen years later and fifteen years later, uh, the, the Hatagama um, was following the abortive Hosokawa-Higuchi uh, efforts in 1993. Um, it was then next that under the Democratic Party of Japan in the years 2005 to 2012. In its 2005 manifesto, the Democratic Party declared a commitment to, quote, do away with the dependent relationship in which Japan ultimately has no alternative but to act in accordance with the U.S. wishes, replacing it with a mature alliance based on independence and equality. Um, so the shared Hatoyama and, and his right-hand man, Ozawa, their shared vision was of a U.S. relationship renegotiated on the basis of equality, of the country reoriented away from U.S.-centered unipolarism towards a multipolar world as a central member of an East Asian community. But both before and during his, the DPJ government of 2009-10, to 10, Hatoyama, as Prime Minister, was subject to a relentless barrage of warnings, threats, and insults issuing from Washington of a kind that only a superior state could possibly issue to its subordinate or client. And the Japanese mass media and much of the political and governing class took up the refrain, uh, forcing in May 2010 the collapse of the Hatoyama government. So thus, the attempt to formulate a post-clientelist autonomous line uh, 21st century Japan in, two, in 1993 and in 2009 thus failed. The autonomous faction was neutralized. The San Francisco Treaty Order could be renewed or reinforced, but it could not be qualified or negated. When, when in, 2000 and, in May 2010, Hatayama handed over the reins of government to Kan Naoto, Kan's task was described throughout the national media 
as to heal the wounds uh, that Hatayama had caused to the alliance and to restore Washington's trust and confidence. Kahn's first diet opening speech promised a deepening of stable alliance relations. It marked a return to serve our politics in which the principal role of the government of Japan was to serve Japan's US sponsors and masters. As for Abe, whether or not he was conscious of the contradiction, his agenda in what I've described as, uh, as clientelism, uh, part, well, phase one, <coughs> 1.0, um, whether or not he was conscious of the contradiction, his agenda was clearly at odds with that of Nye and the Japan handlers. His politics, and especially his ideology, worried Washington almost as much as had the Hatayama Ozawa agenda. What did it mean when he spoke of his mission as taking Japan back? From whom would he take it back? Where would he take it to? What did it signify that he denied or equivocated about war responsibility, comfort women, and Nanji? And that he insisted on rewriting Japanese history to make people proud? The United States could scarcely share the view of Abe and of organizations such as Nihon Kaigi, um, which tended to believe that Japan was suffering a malaise rooted in the erosion of traditional collectivist ways by US-type individualism, and which therefore emphasized homogenous state rituals and school ceremonies centered on the flag and anthem. These things stirred deep unease in Washington. What Abe was assigned to do was scarcely compatible with the role of Japan as a client state. During his first term, Abe strove to avoid offense by keeping away from Yasukuni uh, and by battling to try to block the adoption in the US House of, Rep House of Representatives of the resolution denouncing Japan for its failure to acknowledge and compensate the comfort women victims. But he failed. The contradiction between nationalism and civility was unbridgeable. Clientelism Mark I was no longer, was no long-term solution. By the time he resumed the Prime Ministership in 2012, facing the fact that the contradiction between the aspiration to cast off post-war strictures and become a normal state, um, and the desire to continue Japan's client state subordination to the United States, attaching priority to serving and pleasing it, could not be resolved, he modified his stance. He began by softening and gradually proceeded to abandon his nationalist principles and to head the country into a new and deeper phase of clientelism, clientelism 2.0, as you might call it. This is a term I don't use in the book, and it's a term that's, that's been in my mind as I've been thinking about the, the book since the, the last version of, of, the, of it went to, to the publishers. While Abe appears to have thought that his general compliance on strategic and military matters would persuade Washington to withdraw its objections to his neo-nationalist ideological agenda, he was wrong. When he went ahead in December 2013 to make a formal visit to Yasukuni, the Clinton administration issued a stinging rebuke. Thereafter, he stepped back, trimming his sails by deleting from his vocabulary all talk of shedding the husk of the post-war state and making no further Yasukuni visit. Uh, he, he, one of the major themes that uh, he shifted to adopting from this time on was that of positive pacifism. And that, of course, was music to Washington's ears because it meant cooperation in U.S. military and strategic agendas. For Abe, the epitome of positive pacifism is the United States. As Orwell put it, peace means war. Thus, Abe, during the years of his second government, 2012-14, sacrificed his neo-nationalist principles to clientelism, abandoning his radical constitutional agenda. <coughs> in 2015, he was therefore at last honored with a state visit to Washington. Uh, the bilateral relationship was acclaimed, acclaimed as an alliance of hope and declared by N Joseph Nye to be in the best condition in decades. And of course, it has only gone better still um, uh, since then, and especially under the current Trump administration. By 2018, the priorities of his government were very different from those he had professed when first assuming office 12 years earlier. His constitutional revision package was now feeble and contradictory. The comfort women issue was settled, um, not permanently, but it was settled by agreement with the government of South Korea 
Um, gone was the agenda of a nationalist firebrand <coughs> intent on remaking the state in accord with the grand post-Cold War, post-Servile program. Things that mattered to Washington had priority over things that mattered to Nihon Kaigi or indeed to Abe himself. Abe committed Japan during this phase to a, a new level of incorporation in the projection of US hegemony over global land, sea, uh, space, and cyberspace. Uh, I'll skip a little here. Uh, the price of, part of the price of Japan's peace state was, of course, J Okinawa's war state, both in the, in the occupation period um, many decades ago uh, and in, in continuing form. And of course, I, I write in some considerable detail in the book about Okinawa, which I won't, um, for time reasons, I'll omit from this presentation now. Um, the remarkable fact, however, is that all attempts over decades by the two governments, Japan and the United States, to persuade, buy off, or intimidate the people of the Okinawa Islands um, have failed. Modern Japanese history has no precedent for the phenomenon of a prefecture saying no to the authorities of the world's two great powers. Numerous resolutions of the Okinawan Parliament, the Okinawan Prefectural Assembly, um, opposing, declaring opposition to the, uh, the, the agenda for, um, for reinforcing the base system in Okinawa have been passed. Um, and of course, um, uh, the, uh, under the current governor, um, opposition to the construction of the new uh, base at, uh, uh, at Hinoko in northern Okinawa has been plain. It goes without saying that the Japanese state could easily just crush the Okinawan resistance. Um, but it, it, so far at least it does so only tentatively, perhaps fearful of provoking outright rebellion or even secession. The state stratagem appears to be to sow despair among Okinawans by showing an unyielding determination and overwhelming might. One of the most moving spectacles in contemporary Japan is the daily confrontation between Okinawan protesters, often women and men in their 60s to 80s, and the police and coast guard forces mobilized against them. Uh, usually 100 or uh, 100, maybe 150 in number each day over the last decade, the protesters sit down to try to block with their bodies truck access to the construction site at Camp Schwab. Riot police pick them up, cart them unceremoniously away and dump them by the roadside, only for them to get up, brush themselves off and return once again to the same. Some have been doing this on a daily basis for years uh, and, uh, and uh, there, there seems no end to it. So um, let me sort of wind this up now. Against the backdrop of its economy remaining in the doldrums since the bursting of the bubble at the end of the 90s, both officials and ordinary people long for ways for Japan to have confidence and pride. Mori's divine country, Abe's stress on nationalistic symbols stem from a deep sense of uncertainty. Reconstruction of Japan along the lines of the nationalism that Abe prescribed would likely lead only to ever deeper emptiness and isolation as U.S. hegemony continues to weaken and its economy to grow more feeble. The more that the United States grows feeble and flounders, the closer Japan under clientelism Mark II seems to want to cling. Abe may have dropped the clientelism Mark I grand vision he once articulated of liquidating the post-war American-granted regi American regime and of comprehensively revising the Constitution. But he nevertheless aligns himself with the idea of a Shintoist, beautiful, and new Japan in preference to the democratic, citizen-based, anti-militarist Japan. His agenda from 2012 has involved widening state prerogatives, circumscribing citizen rights, reinforcing national security, proclaiming a Japan whose citizens would be expected or required to love it and in future to die for it. In English analyses of Japan, I'm aware that my picture is darker than most. <clears throat> I would wish it to be more roseate, but the fact is that in my 56 years of engagement with Japan, I've never felt such foreboding over the country's present and future course. 
However, I should not suggest that the picture is all dark. A series of high-level international conferences in 2018 addressing Korean Peninsula issues shows just how suddenly war preparation can give way to peace cooperation and how suddenly long-frozen diplomatic logjams may break up. If a peace treaty to end the Korean War can suddenly be put on the bargaining table, so can an end to the US military dominance of Japan, the closure and return of the American bases in Okinawa, the liquidation of the military dominance of Japan and Korea by the United States that Joseph Nye in 1995 insisted was indispensable. I detect a strong common sentiment in Japan in favor of universalist civil democratic principles, a wish to play a central positive role in the struggle for the cause of humanity in an epoch of climate change, global warming and species loss, for the outlawing of nuclear weapons, for the substitution of renewables for nuclear and fossil fuel energy systems, and for maintaining, even reinforcing, the constitutional commitment to peace. How to, how to get a government that will overcome the barriers of clientelism and pursue these goals, that is the problem that the Japanese people today face. Thanks very much. Well, I'll continue from this, and I want to start off by saying that um, Gavin and I go back a very long way. We first met, um, I think, in the summer of 1962. I wonder how many of the audience were born since then, and so on. <laughs> uh, and we met at a youth hostel in Sawara, a town in Chibaken, on the uh, Tone Gawa, Tone River, uh, in the summer of 1962. Story is a little bit interesting because the uh, proprietor of the youth hostel had um, contacted the uh, Australian Embassy in Tokyo saying that he had planted a number of Australian eucalyptus trees in his garden and to celebrate this he wanted to uh, entertain as many uh, Australian students studying in Tokyo or in Japan as possible and would the uh, embassy please um, round them up and send them to him. The embassy uh, tried hard but could only identify three <laughs> such people. Uh, the, I think the uh, proprietor was expecting about 20 or 30 or something like that. Uh, no, that wasn't possible. Uh, one was Gavin, one was me, and the third was the um, son of the uh, cur then current uh, Australian ambassador in Tokyo. I think his name was McIntyre, yes. if I remember wrong. Is that right? I think so. Yeah. Uh, who was on vacation uh, from the University of Cambridge. Now, um, Gavin and I were very new to Japan at that point. We hadn't been here there very long. We were both uh, doing research for our thesis or, or for a general uh, research project. Um, we had, I think at that stage, certainly I had at that stage, a pretty rudimentary knowledge of Japanese, although some knowledge of Japanese. Uh, and the son of the ambassador had no Japanese. But the proprietor of the uh, youth hostel knew that the son of the ambassador was the son of the ambassador, therefore a very prestigious person, and expected him to be our spokesperson. But since he could only speak English, and not Japanese, uh, Gavin and I had to try to interpret for him. And this was not an easy process. <laughs> Uh, and then, um, oh yes, and the, there's another little bit here, because they took us on the river, the Tonegawa, in a boat. I don't know whether Gavin remembers this. Yes, yes. And we went along, and on the bank, uh, I think it was a farmhouse there or something, and um, some people hailed us and said, they saw we were guiding we were foreigners, said, come, we'd like to entertain you at our, at our house, you see. And, and uh, they, um, we, we disembarked and went in and... Uh, uh, they, they provided us with what we thought was beer, beer mugs or beer glasses. And when we actually tasted it, it turned out not to be beer, it was this much of it, but whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> and um, somehow or other, <laughs> we got back onto the boat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. that's, that's, that's by way of introduction. Now, to be serious, 
My admiration for Gavin's indefatigable scholarship and commitment to the causes he believes in, there is no balance. He is, um, par, par excellence, uh, I use French words here, a scholar engagé, uh, who has also unrivaled knowledge of relevant sources and, and, and much personal experience of what he is uh, researching. This, I think, is a very good correction to what I've described as desiccated scholarship or irrelevant scholarship, or even worse, scholarship based on unanalyzed un un and unproven assumptions, for instance, that everything should operate to an American standard. His scholarship has been largely focused on the politics and political history of Japan, and to a lesser extent, Korea, and of international relations in East Asia more generally. <coughs> Broadly speaking, what I agree with in his writings is much more extensive than what I disagree with. But there are things that I disagree with, or at least would prefer a certain rebalancing. I agree that successive Japanese conservative governments have been illiberal in many of their policies, both domestic and international. I agree that this has got worse since the 1980s, uh, perhaps starting with Nakasone, who was Prime Minister between 1982 and 1987. Uh, he had quite a, a, a strong nationalist uh, streak in his, in his uh, ideas and character. Um, I believe that for many years in Japan, uh, under the usually single party rule of, of the Liberal Democratic Party, uh, for many years there has been a power elite in Japan comprising the political leadership based on the LDP, the government bureaucracy, big business, with strong influences with other interest groups including agriculture, and not least, uh, of course, from the government of the United States. I agree that successive governments have observed basic principles of liberalism and democracy rather superficially, although there's difference between different periods, uh, rather than with commitment and dedication. But nevertheless, the system, uh, until the Abbe period, I would suggest, has been within the broad parameters of liberal democracy in small letters, not the large letters of the, of the party, the Liberal Democratic Party. And that is particularly the case, well, uh, let's rephrase that, but with the um, Abbe government, uh, it is, as Gavin has uh, eloquently uh, argued, uh, beholden to the Nippon Kaigi, the Japan Association, and to the Shinto Seiji Remme and other similar organizations, which are of the extreme nationalist nostalgic right. Uh, and these are uh, indeed ideological groups having an extreme, uh, of the extreme right wing, authoritarian, nostalgic nationalist color, coloring. Uh, and it is a very important point to make that nearly all members of the current cabinet and recent cabinets under the Abe government um, have been members of the, these organizations, as have the bulk of the LDP members of the national diet. Uh, freedom of speech and human rights under the Abe government have been under attack um, in various ways. Um, I've, I've written of this in um, my book with uh, the, scholar, the scholar from the University of Leeds, uh, Kweku Ampia, in, in our book Rethinking Japan, uh, which had um, a launch here uh, sometime in the last year. I agree that Japan has been closely aligned with the United States. Uh, I don't quite use the word um, clientelism, but there has been a very close alignment with the United States, particularly in its um, uh, defense policies and its policies in East Asia over the period since the occupation ended in 1952. There was an interesting break uh, discussed by Gavin in his book with this during the period uh, of the DPJ, Democratic Party of Japan government, uh, in the early period under Prime Minister Hatoyama Yukio uh, from September 
2009 until the early months of 2010. But Hatoyama uh, had neither sufficient power, uh, partly I agree because of pressure from the United States, nor sufficient cunning uh, to make, make his policies stick. And indeed, the left, uh, sorry, the US had a part in his downfall. But I believe that was compounded by the fact uh, that he was not particularly uh, strategic in what he was doing. He didn't really allow himself or give himself a fallback position. Uh, he had promised to one of the minor parties in, in his coalition uh, that um, he would move the. Uh, the contentious marine base out of Okinawa itself, he could not provide a place, whether in Japan or outside Japan, in somewhere like Guam, in order to do that. And the whole thing fell through, partly because of US pressure, but I would argue partly also because of the uh, rather inept um, uh, lack of strategy by Hatoyama. Perhaps there was no alternative, I don't know. I agree in the main with what Gavin has said in two successive books and other writings about Okinawa and the issue of American bases there. And um, I was actually at his seminar precisely one week ago in the University of Leeds where he discussed the Okinawan issue and he has written uh, two books and many other uh, writings uh, about the Okinawan issue. Um, I think that Gavin has become the world expert on the detail of Okinawan issues and uh, Okinawan struggles over American bases. And indeed, Okinawans have had a raw deal over many decades, and they're even now seen as remote from Tokyo, from the perspective of Tokyo. Uh, some people in the government, uh, or those close to the government, I think regard them as not really properly Japanese. Uh, they have a different history, after all, from, from mainland Japan. Uh, and as, in a sense, expendable. It is, after all, Okinawa, a very remote uh, from Tokyo and, and very small in geographic area, though considerable in population, uh, prefecture of Japan. And in an, at the Leeds, uh, Leeds uh, book launch last uh, week, <coughs> and I did ask Gavin the question, how is it that despite all the pressure despite all the cards apparently being in the uh, American hands or the, government, the Japanese government's hands, that it has taken more than 22 years to shift this marine base from the urban area uh, to uh, this coastal area, an area of outstanding national beauty, and it still isn't completely resolved, although it may be on the way to resolution. I think that Gavin has made Okinawa's central concern as you will see from the amount of space he devotes to Okinawa in this book, The State of the Japanese State. But I do disagree about some things, some of the things he writes about. Uh, for instance, what he says, some things he says about the emperor system. This is just the first of my disagreements. He has unearthed much fascinating material about the role of the Showa emperor, um, known outside Japan as uh, Hirohito, or in Japanese pronunciation, Hirohito, uh, a name that is rarely used in Japan, incidentally, because uh, since his death he was always known as the Showa Emperor, and the present emperor on his abdication next year will be known, of course, as the Heisei Emperor. So personal names aren't really used for emperors very much in Japan. Uh, the Showa Emperor's role in the immediate chaotic aftermath of World War II uh, this is something very fascinating, very many fascinating things he's, he's dug up uh, about all this. Although I still think he somewhat exaggerates the role of the Shawa Emperor at that time. Uh, but he, he says very little about the fact that the Shawa Emperor from 1978, uh, when the souls, the, there are no mortal remains, uh, of uh, Class A war criminals, uh, so designated by the Tokyo trials after the war, were enshrined in the Yasukuni uh, shrine. Uh, and and uh, the Shoa Emperor refused from then on to uh, visit the Yasukuni shrine, and that is a policy that has been continued with the present emperor 
uh, ever since he came to the throne in 1989. Uh, Yaskuni, I think, the Yaskuni shrine has a great deal to answer for. It is a shrine to nationalism in many respects. The Yushuk and the museum there is a uh, a museum of, of, of nationalism in a, and, and uh, of, I would say, historical reinterpretation uh, in a very nationalistic sense. Um, and uh, this, I think, is, is, is something that uh, something should be done about. I mean, the, the alternative uh, memorial at uh, Chidorika Gofuchi in Tokyo uh, is a much more neutral place so far as um, war memory is concerned. Uh, he does mention on page 201 of the uh, book, uh, the present book, uh, the present emperor's clear liberal preferences. And, and uh, although the emperor has, by the constitution, no political role or whatever, um, he does sometimes, or has sometimes rather subtly indicated his views uh, on, for instance, uh, the uh, forced uh, singing in schools of the national anthem, Kimigayo, and the hoisting of the uh, national flag. Uh, so th that uh, is something that uh, Gavin touches on, and I would very much agree with that. But I also disagree with some aspects of what he says about Japan as a client state of the US. I think this was true of the occupation, but as Japan built up its economic strength, it did have the potential, at least, to develop much greater independence from the US. Uh, and there was a period, you may remember, in the <coughs> 1980s when Detroit car workers were smashing up Toyotas in, in uh, grand style. Uh, so there was a great resentment about uh, the uh, Japanese uh, economic miracle in uh, the industries of the United States, and indeed, to some extent, in Europe. No doubt the relative stagnation of the Japanese economy since the 1990s, especially by comparison with the resurgent China, has reduced Japan's freedom of action by comparison with the earlier period. Mr. Abe's rapid embrace of President Trump, uh, he was the first national leader, uh, as I understand it, to, to meet, manage actually to meet with uh, President Trump after his inauguration, <coughs> seems to me a kind of preemptive strike to ensure that President Trump took Japanese concerns seriously. I'm not sure that it's, it's a complete explanation of that event uh, to say that this was simply subservience to President Trump. I think he was making a, giving a message to the new administration that Japan wants to be take, taken seriously. There is also the rela related question of what alternative might there have been to the Japan-US Security Treaty. Now, Gavin has always, uh, already men uh, mentioned this, but um, I had remembered uh, that it was a Japanese, uh, sorry, an American general, I didn't remember the name, it's uh, General Spackpole, as he reminds me, uh, who I uh, surmise uh, had uh, drunk a delicious bottle of vintage wine, and then he came up with the idea uh, that uh, the Japan-US Security Treaty was the cork in the bottle. In other words, its uh, ulterior motive uh, was to keep Japan in hand, uh, to prevent Japan going off uh, and doing its own thing, uh, and developing a uh, uh, defense capability, not only capability, but also ambitions uh, on its own. But would a fully independent Japanese defense policy without alliances under a highly nationalist government really be preferable, do we think, uh, from to the present situation? Uh, I, I, I wonder about that. Um, I mean, if you had Abe unchained, as it were, in, in his nationalist phase, not his most, most recent phase, as uh, the government has described it, um, would that be a better outcome than the present situation of the cork in the bottle? I'm interested and to some extent agree with his uh, praise for the Hatoyama uh, government, very brief government, despite its chaotic implementation. Uh, but if Hatoyama had had his way, and, and I would have 
welcomed that in many ways, but if he'd had his way uh, and, and managed to reorientate uh, Japanese foreign policy in a, in a direction less connected with the US, more connected with China and other parts of Asia, would that have worked given the very strongly expansionist ambitions of, of the present Chinese regime and uh, Xi Jinping? And I think that is a de very debatable area. Um, so how is Japan supposed to cope now with a resurgent imperialistic China? Or indeed with the DPRK North Korea uh, and its nuclear rearmament, although we have to say now, uh, I welcome this, that the Korean situation is now very much up in the air. Incidentally, I think we both agree very much on this, that the real hero so far in, in the Korean negotiations going on uh, is really the uh, president of uh, South Korea, uh, President Moon Jae-in, and I would say that he's a, a much more important a actor in this than, than President Trump, but everything is up for grabs, we don't know how this is going to wait, work out. Um, there's another point which is uh, perhaps more trivial, but um, I, I think that Mr. Koizumi, the Prime Minister in the early 2000s, was a very different sort of politician uh, from Mr. Abe. Uh, Koizumi was a neoliberal economic reformer, uh, although he, 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 he said all sorts of things which were, were uh, uh, relevant also to what Mr. Abe has been saying. Nevertheless, what he did was very different. He, Mr. Koizumi was trying to revive the economy and, and uh, make it very neoliberal, uh, revise the whole uh, uh, or uh, privatise the whole uh, post office uh, services, including the slush fund of, of the, um, uh, the, the bank that the uh, post office was running and so on. Um, and uh, on the contrary, Mr. Abe has been a nationalist, constitutionalist, radical, at least in turn. So this is it, what they've done rather than what they have actually said. I think it is important to remember that since 1945, uh, Japan has been essentially at peace, uh, and public opinion reflects this. And that is, I think, why uh, the uh, Article 9 of the Constitution is still very popular in Japan. And let us look back to history from the Meiji period to 1868 to 1945, when Japan essentially was at war every 10 years. What a contrast to the post war situation where Japan has been at peace. Now, I, I think it may well be the case, uh, although that was brought, out, brought about by a combination of Article 9, and I would say also um, some aspects at least of the Security Treaty, uh, and that, that it seems to me is a magnificent achievement, but I have to say under Mr. Abe there are some signs that this whole uh, virtuous circle, if you like, may be breaking down. I now want, almost finally, to move to my most important point, uh, and this is very much a political science sort of point. On the Japanese political system, Gavin seems to emphasize continuity, whereas I tend to, well I, I agree there's been huge continuity with the LDP in power most of the time, but I do also emphasize change. This has a structural element, because up to the mid-1990s, when the uh, lower house electoral system was changed. Um, the LDP factionless, uh, factional system gave a strong element of pluralism to the central political system, particularly of the LDP itself, which was at the centre of decision making. And at the centre of the system up to the 1990s, there were leaders such as Miyazawa Kiichi, uh, also. Um, uh, uh, Miki Takeo, but less important, I think. Miyazawa was very much at the centre, and he was a supporter of the 1947 Constitution. There's nobody around pretty well like that in the present day LDP, or hardly anybody. The opposition also had some blocking power in, in those days. Uh, today, however, after the change in the electoral system for the lower house, uh, which uh, did away with the multi-member constituency system which led to a situation where uh, LDP members were fighting each other at elections as well as 
candidates from opposition parties, and, and therefore they, they had rival factions backing them at each, in each constituency. That has gone. Uh, most of the seats now are single member, like the British system. Uh, and this has led, along with uh, the uh, reforms uh, to the uh, central uh, governmental system put in place by Mr. Hashimoto in the late, late 1990s, uh, which came into force just in time for Mr. Koizumi to, to take advantage of them in 2001 when he became Prime Minister. Uh, th this has led uh, to a situation in which the executive is very much more powerful. The Prime Minister and the Prime Minister's office, or sorry, the Cabinet office, is very much more powerful than it was in the earlier period up to the 1990s, uh, when uh, the executive, and particularly the Prime Minister, was conspicuously weak, although the system as a whole, of course, was, was very dominant. Uh, so today we have a, a much more monolithic LDP, a weak opposition, weaker LDP factionalism, weaker LDP committees, uh, which uh, could veto um, uh, decisions of cabinet in the previous period, much more power to the executive, and Abe can do what he likes in many ways. But now, of course, as Gavin has uh, very eloquently described, he is jeopardizing his power by indulging in cronyist activities like the Moritomo Gakuen and Kake Gakuen issues, which uh, cover all the front pages of the newspapers at the present time. To some extent, factions are coming back, but essentially as organized support groups for rival LDP leadership candidates. Will Abe survive in September when the uh, LDP presidential elections come around? My own candidate for succession would be Korno Taro, the present uh, foreign minister, who is a very independent-minded person. Uh, he's written a book attacking uh, nuclear um, power stations. He wants to abolish them. Uh, has a very good mind, in my view, although I wouldn't agree with everything he says. And my estimate is uh, that it's a pretty open contest now, uh, with Abe still having, I think, a good chance to stay on in power. But if a really uh, Im impressive candidate like Corner, Corner were to put his uh, oar into the, to this, uh, he would stand uh, a reasonable chance of being elected. In the longer term, we should follow the career of Koizumi's son, uh, who's a very impressive politician, but at present I think he's too young seriously to contest the leadership. In conclusion, I see this book as a major contribution to the understanding of Japanese politics today. Gavin has shown us that the politics of Japan contains many extremely unhealthy aspects, not least in the area of human rights and freedom of speech. Um, and also, of course, in aspects, at least, of the relationship with the United States. Although I, I think that there's some great complexities in that where I wouldn't completely go along with what he says. I disagree with him to some extent where, in anatomizing what is wrong with the Japanese government and its policies, he perhaps underestimates the very real problems that Japan has with other governments, most notably that of a resurgent China.